What's up Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another video. Today we are going to be reacting to the latest game theory video or the latest game theory FNAF video at least. We solved Golden Freddy again featuring MatPat. Now a few things before I get started. Firstly it's really cool that Matt's coming back for a FNAF video. It clearly has this FNAF passion, even if he has a lot of different hot takes. Like that that that's the that's a key thing, right? Matt Pat has that passion for FNAF and you can tell he misses it, right? I also want to address the elephant in the room, which is the fact that I haven't uploaded in so long. And the reason is because I got myself a flat. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally moved in like two weeks ago into a new flat and I'm away from my parents now, and so I'm gonna be able to record a lot more videos, and I'm gonna be able to collab with a lot of American people, and it's gonna be so nice to have my own place where I can just make my own videos. But I'm not gonna keep blabbering on about that. I am very sorry if the audio quality isn't the best today. Uh, as you can tell, I haven't been able to like get my microphone out and stuff like that, but hopefully it is Okay, I just want to get a video delivered to you. I think without further ado, we should begin. What are my thoughts on Golden Freddy right now? It changes from time to time. I think the, the, the big overarching theory that I have is probably Golden Duo, which is the theory that both the crying child and Cassidy uh, possess Golden Freddy and they leave at certain points. Um, crying child goes with Michael at some point and Cassidy goes off maybe into Yendo and then into Molten Freddy and blah, 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 blah. I don't really know. I haven't really FNAF theorized in so long. So we're just going to see what's up. Let's go. The crying child's name has been found. Okay. That's right. We finally have an answer for a question that has stumped this community for a little really? decade. And the craziest part of all of it, it was solved by a channel with only one video. <laughs> Matt must be rolling okay. in retirement grave. We'll just see about that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I know, I, might, I think I might know what channel that is talking about. I think it's dual process theory. I think they they made like an hour long video and it was their first video and it was about solving FNAF and they weren't kidding or something like that. I haven't watched it. I've seen it in my recommended. I've seen it has like over a million views and I've seen MatPat has been reacting to it as well, but I haven't seen any of it. If you guys want me to react to that as well, then let me know, I can do that. Hello, internet. Welcome, Welcome to, to Game, Game Theory. Theory. The show that's happy to let someone else solve FNAF for a change. Since the release of Security Breach, it feels like there's been a massive new wave of FNAF theorizing on YouTube. Yeah. We've seen the rise of people like John FNAF, Right yeah. Toast, ID's Fantasy, and dozens more. My friends. More. Oh All my God, it's me. <laughs> oh my God, it's literally me. What? <laughs> How, how, how have I made it here with these amazing YouTubers right here? We have Hyperdroid, Sire Squawks is on there. Nice one, Sire. Uh, we have ID's Fantasy, FNAF, Rytoast. Um, I think that's not real name, not at all. I might be wrong about that. Uh, and then there's me. <laughs> that is the second time I've been in a Game Theory FNAF video. The first time was in that weird controversial one about, about MatPat saying people, people have different theories because they have different personality types etc i i did appear in that one and i was pretty pleased but but the topic of the video was a bit naff so naff <laughs> like for naff okay let's continue <laughs> the infuriating lore of this franchise and just over a month ago a new challenger or should i say challengers entered the ring the channel dual process theory okay I, I thought so big for their first outing making the claim that okay. they solved the entirety of fnaf in their very first video and i don't not believe only it were they laying down a timeline for the whole series they also claimed to have solved a particular mystery that has been bugging us theorists for a long time what is the name of the crying child after new Okay. In 10 years, we still just call him the crying child, despite the fact that every other character in this franchise seems to get a name. Mike, Elizabeth, Charlie, uh, even the missing children got names. So why is this kid's name sure. left blank? Well, according to dual process theory, it's not that he doesn't have a name, it's that we just missed it. We've had the name all along, we've just been giving it to someone else. They suggest that the crying child's name... Prediction. I think Tom is about to say... Or I think dual process theories theory might be that it's Cassidy. And don't know how I feel about that. 
Cassidy in the books is a girl. I'm not saying that this isn't possible. I'm just saying like it, it's set up to be a female character. And I mean, we don't fully know the gender identity of the crying child, but like, yeah. Oh no, we do because technically it's the brother of the older brother of Michael. It's the brother of Michael. So, but anyway, um, moving on from that, <laughs> not another gender debate. I feel like it, it, it is going to be Cassidy and I can sort of, I can see it, but I'm not sure. I, I, let's continue. The crying child's name is Cassidy. Okay, the there name we go. we found all the way back in the word search of the survival yeah, logbook. The yeah. same name that, for the longest time, we but have given two to characters the in the logbook. from Ultimate Custom Night. The one Afton should not There's have There's one killed. who writes in faded that, text and one that changes. That the child we thought was Cassidy doesn't even exist. For years, we've assumed that there are seven dead kids. There five definitely children's are. children's incident victims, including Cassidy, Charlotte, Emily, the puppet, and the nameless crying child. But instead, they claim that there are only ever been six with the final missing kid and the bite victim being one in the same okay few issues with this first of all the big elephant in the room right now is the crying child gets bit in the bite of 83 surely he dies right and so then how does he go missing as, as one of the missing children second thing is okay fine six dead kids kind of lines up with into the pit right but then you have like I think there's seven graves, or is it eight? I can't remember if it's seven or eight. I think it might be eight, actually. Never mind. But you have seven uh, victims in the Toy Chica high school cutscenes in Ultimate Custom Night. Like, I, I think there's very clearly set up to be seven missing kids, or, or seven kids, sorry. And I think it's probably um, Gabriel, Jeremy, Fritz, Susie, Cassidy, Charlie, and Andrew, maybe? Um, I don't know. That That's just my thoughts on it. Obviously, I'm going to get a lot of comments now saying, you can't incorporate the books into the games. I do what I want. Thank you. It's just what I believe. <laughs> Cassidy Afton. It's a bold claim, but when you get into the meat of it, their argument is actually quite compelling. So I went back to the okay. board and started mapping out the pieces myself to see if I could come to that same conclusion. Is right. the crying child it's a good way to do it. Cassidy? Ladies and gentlemen, it's it up. What you doing? Oh, hey, Matt. I'm, uh, Kind of in the middle of solving FNAF. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm sure you have a theory that changes everything. A clue that we missed? Oh, God. I mean, kinda, yeah. Perfect. Well, before you fire up the old Golden Freddy thumbnail and then slap a dark truth on that, I've got another real? to solve. Lore fi It's the oh, music I've heard about mystery this. project that I've been working on. Basically, it's what you get if you have Lo Fi Girl, but you mix in a murder mystery. Let Ooh, me know if you want me to react to that. The good news is you don't have to wonder anymore. That would be good to theorize episode on. Episode 1 is finally ready. On one level, you could just study and relax and sleep to the music nice. that you're listening to. In fact, you've been listening to one of the tracks this whole time. And there's gonna be new music releasing every week on our Lorefy Spotify Sick. channel. But you know what? If you want to go a level That's deeper, really cool. hidden within some of that music and the videos that exist here on YouTube, there are clues pointing at the story of... One a of a kind. Kid, a missing kid Never seen anything Gregory. like this before. It's really Gregory. cool. Seriously, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hear me out. Hear me out. Yeah, I got nothing. I just wanted to meme on the name. Good news, though. My Gregory, okay, not a robot. Yeah, sure. For now, I assume you put a link in the description on your way in. I did indeed, sir. And people should. I bet it's going to be revealed that like Gregory said, is actually a robot. Secrets waiting to be discovered oh, every week over on Spotify. It's a new Matt animation Pat, dropping <laughs> roughly once a month, month and a half here on YouTube. All as we help a new okay. character, Taylor, solve the deadly game that she. I love the art style. It's really good. <sighs> Do I really have to solve this? I kind of got my hands full with all the FNAF stuff coming down the pipeline. Yeah, I, was I need to just talk about that. doing Morty on dual process theories theory. Oh, I remember that one. It's a great video. But uh, you do realize the M in Morty stands for Matt Pat, right? Matt Pat occasionally reviews theories, yo. Huh? Didn't think about that. Say, Matt, I know you're kind of retired and everything, but seeing how dual process theories video was a two-person effort and you're already here, how would you like to tag wow. team the SNAF theory? I mean, it's a little... Dual game theory? The closet with the two of us, Man. but uh, sure, why not? Awesome, and now I don't have to change the theme this song. Is, Hit this it, is kind of crazy. I'm... Theories in the comments below. I'll pick my favorites in the next episode of Morty. <laughs> 
first things first, okay. it's probably a good idea that Onto we the recap the main evidence points dual process okay. theory has for the crying child being Cassidy. Their video is going to take a lot of brain power. Two well, hours. Much time. Well, except for you, considering <sighs> you took over four hours to react to it. Look, okay. I'm retired now. I've got nothing but time. But I think you're right. So let's quickly recap, starting with the first major point: how we got the name in the survival logbook. Okay, now, we know this. This book Cassidy. has been a cornerstone of the FNAF franchise since its release. Inside, we have three yeah. separate people. We're still finding stuff. Michael in it as Lapton, well. who writes in red pen, a spirit that writes in faded text, and a third person that alters the text of the book. Exactly. The faded text three writes people. the words my name on a number of the pages. And on those pages, there's always some sort of weird number. Take all those numbers and turn them into coordinates for the word search, and bam, you get the name Cassidy. Yeah. It sounds so simple now, but I remember ripping my hair out over this at the same time you were. But the key to the whole thing but was that's one talking very to each other. That's two characters. Of my name. On one of the pages, the my name appears okay. on a gravestone, just like yes. the gravestone missing yes. a name from FNAF 6's ending, which, it should be remembered, released around the same time as this book. Yeah, so absolutely. it's pretty darn obvious that these clues were revealing the name of that final character, the fifth missing child, which is why for the longest time we've been calling the fifth child Cassidy. And this is where dual process theory throws their first spanner into the works. Oh, you mean no. Wrench? Look, you chose a British guy to take over. This is what you get. While, yes, my name appeared on every page the clues were hiding, notice what's on the opposite page of the word search. A mirror. And under it, the spirit leaves a message. What do you see? Well, what's on the other page? A crying child using altered text in the word search. It's me, Cassidy. Oh. God, so good. It is pretty compelling, oh. especially because, in all honesty, the placement of that mirror oh. always felt suspicious to me. Oh. <laughs> oh no. Oh. Okay, how do I... Where do I start? I think... I think that's... That's cool. I think that's a really cool detail and, and very cool usage of those pages to kind of put together your own theory. I think that's, that's a really cool way to throw your own um, takes into it. But... I, I think that doesn't nullify the fact that throughout the rest of the survival logbook, there are very clearly three distinct characters. There are two characters altering the book and kind of writing in, in secrets in the book that are, um, that are talking to each other. What's your favorite ride? The carousel, stuff like that. Do you have a psychic friend, Fred Bear, like etc. etc. There are two characters talking to each other through faded text and through altered text um, throughout the book. And then there's Michael, of course. But I, I think it's very clear that there's those three distinct characters and, and there's those ways to kind of show them. But I do understand what they mean. And I do think the mirror is also, as Matt Pat says, like, like a very strange placement, a very strange choice in the book to put that right after the word search where we find the name Cassidy. I don't think it's good enough evidence to like carry the entire theory, but we'll see where it we'll see where this takes us, right? So I really like them using it for their theory. But if Crying Child is Cassidy, then who else is speaking in the book? You need a second spirit to act as the fated That's text. That's what I mean, well, yeah. Well, according to them, it's Charlie, the puppet, doing what she's been trying oh. to do the entire series. Help the lost spirits find themselves. And again, I gotta say, I really like that. Narratively, that's really satisfying because it brings together the three main characters from the franchise all in the same place. Mike with his red pen, Crying Child Cassidy as the altered text, and Charlie guiding the conversation as the ghostly faded text. It's cool and it feels complete, but is there actual evidence to support this or is it all hypothesis? Hmm. And that's not all. Dual process theory weren't just satisfied with Crying Child having Cassidy's name, they went further to suggest that the Crying Child is Cassidy, as in Cassidy is an Afton and the fifth missing child on the gravestone and the spirit within Golden Freddy, the only spirit inside a Golden Freddy, as opposed to most of our theories where the Crying Child is one I don't and know, half man. of our that's best a golden lot. boy. They also have the evidence to back it up. The first point is that Golden Freddy doesn't speak in plurals. When you take a look at the one line we ever get from Golden Freddy, what do we see? It's me. <sighs> me. Singular. Implying that there's only one spirit in there. No. No. Uh, okay. I, I, I understand the point. I completely understand the point. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, like, this is a fine way to go about it. I'm just thinking, no. I, I don't think that's how it works at all. If you think about it, um, the spirit inside of the puppet is Charlie. We know that for sure. That is completely confirmed at this point. 
Charlie is female. God, I'm gonna go into this whole like gender debate thing again. Anyway, we know that Charlie is female, correct? But the puppet is multiple times referred to as he, right? Uh, that, that, that kind of shows that the robot is, is a he, the puppet is a he, however, the spirit inside is a she, and it doesn't need to align, right? It doesn't need to be a boy soul in a boy robot, etc. And so I think when Golden Freddy says, it's me, I, that how do you know, like, what's your evidence that that is talking specifically about the soul? And even if it is talking about the soul, if there are two souls in there, if there are two souls, it can just be one of them talking, right? My, my whole theory was that, you know, Golden Freddy is possessed by the crying child in some way or another, whether it's just the crying child or whether it's with Cassidy, I think crying child is there in some way, right? And in FNAF 1, when it's Michael as the um, security guard, it's me, like that, that's the crying child saying, it's me, it's your brother, I'm getting revenge on you, almost. Um, and so I think that's only the crying child talking there, even if it is the crying child and Cassidy both in the same body. And I feel like we have some very similar things going on there with the Stitch Wraith, where there are two souls possessing one body and they do refer to themselves as a singular entity as well. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure about that. Like, I, I need more evidence and more support for it talking about the spirit um, rather than the entity as a whole, right? But uh, I, I see the point there. Compare that to what we see in the books. Throughout the series, there have only been two instances of animatronics possessed by multiple people. The first is the Stitch Wraith from the I Fazbear so. Frights epilogues. The second is Rosie Porkchop from the Fazbear yeah. Fright story together. Which is forever. very clearly and a Golden Stitch Freddy Wraith isn't able to speak until the second soul is gone, Rosie Porkchop speaks while still containing both spirits and refers to itself as ladies in waiting. It's using plurals showing the two spirits. We're going to come back to that. That's, point, a, right? yeah, that's actually worry, a good point. Come back that is a good point. I will give it. Okay, that. great, because uh, I have thoughts on that one. The second point they bring up is everyone's favorite FNAF 3 classic, Happiest Day. This is the final mini game where we see the puppet giving cake to the birthday child, surrounded by their friends. Yeah, I, I know where masks. he's going with Once this. Once the puppet delivers the cake, the child stops crying, puts on their golden Freddy mask, and all the children's spirits move on. Well, except for Charlie, because she's still got to show up in FNAF 6. <sighs> yeah, because nothing can ever just be as it seems with this franchise. Yeah. But there is one thing that I think we can both agree is very strange straightforward. There are only six kids at this party, the five missing children and the puppet. If there were supposed to be two spirits inside Golden Freddy, why isn't there a seventh kid? Which ties in perfectly to point number three, the glowing eyes at the end uh... of FNAF 3. This one's personal, so I'll take it. As a reminder, if you beat FNAF 3 without doing the Happiest Day minigame, you hit the game's bad ending. This gives us a screen where our four main animatronics each have one glowing I know eye, going. symbolic of the fact that their spirits haven't been released yet. Seems pretty self-explanatory, right? But then look who we have in the back. Golden Freddy with not just one glowing eye, but two. This was always the backbone it's... to the whole two spirits yeah. debate. The idea that unlike no. all the other animatronics who each had one kid's spirit inside of them, Golden this Freddy wasn't the was backbone. different. He had two. Both the innocent crying child spirit and the vengeful spirit Cassidy, the fifth victim. It was a theory that was further supported by the books, specifically the Stitch Raid Stingers, where we see an animatronic possessed oh, by two man. spirits, a nice wholesome kid named Jake, and an evil angry Andrew. spirit named Andrew. One who dies in a hospital setting like the crying child, and one who dies by a brutal murder from Afton. I mean, the parallels are hard to deny. However, dual process challenges. There's this less of a parallel with the that if there were indeed two spirits in the body, why then do both eyes go out once you complete Happiest Day? Especially since we've believed that the Cassidy spirit lingers on to torture Afton in Ultimate Custom Night. Only one light should have gone out. To which I have one answer: Retcon. retcon. But obviously, that's a bit of a cheap that explanation. That's very cheap. Avoid it. Which brings us to dual processes. <laughs> 
last point. How can the crying child be the fifth missing kid when very clearly he's not missing? Like he's literally right here in yeah, front of a large and he gets room of bit. people. Well, they make the assumption that this was all part of William's scheme. After the bite of 83, William Ooh. pulls his child out of the hospital and while experimenting with harvesting remnants, has the bright idea to stuff his son into Golden Freddy. Whoops, bad idea, Will. It doesn't work and the spring locks kill him, which is why we see Golden Freddy twitching in Ultimate Custom Night in the same way William does during the FNAF 3 teaser. This mistake devastates him and in a drunken <sighs> stupor, he lashes out at Henry's daughter, Charlie, killing her last. This then aligns with what we see from the gravestone puzzle in Help Wanted 2. To solve it, you have to light the gravestones marked by the six dead children in a specific okay. order, presumably the order in which they died. Chica, the first, she has seen everything, followed by <laughs> yeah, Foxy, she has Freddy, seen everything. Bonnie, then Golden Freddy, and finally, the puppet. Later, when the police start to investigate the disappearances at the restaurant, William claims his child also went missing to throw them off the scent that he may be the killer. Now, while I don't really love the logical <sighs> jumps their explanation takes there, one thing I really do like about the crying child being the fifth missing victim, and therefore the only spirit inside Golden Freddy, is that it really does help clean up the numbers. For years, five uh, was the magic number in FNAF yeah. when it came to dead kids. Then, around FNAF 3, it evolved into six with the inclusion of the puppet. And yet, FNAF 4 shows us what was presumably a seventh kid dying in the form of the crying child. And while Help Wanted does eventually give us seven graves and a hidden out of bounds eight, Easter egg, it always bugged me that there was never a gravestone for him in the FNAF 6 ending. I always just assumed that it was because he ended up being different. He wasn't a victim of Afton's, and thus he wasn't included in that final image. But if Crying Child is, in fact, the fifth kid, it helps explain why there was never an additional grave for him. Because he was always there to begin with. He was the one hidden behind the grass. They also don't mention this in their theory, but in FNAF 3, <sighs> look at the spirit who gets Afton Springlocked. They have tears streaming down their face, just like the crying child. We never see the other spirit's faces. We're specifically being shown that this one has tears, revealing uh, that this isn't a separate spirit from the crying uh, child. They are one in the same. <laughs> even use the same model in FNAF World specifically for the crying child. To be that fair, tears are everywhere in the series, though. I mean, the puppet is shown yeah. crying literally all the and, and time. The crying child so, isn't are we puppet. done? Did they solve FNAF? Can I retire now, too? <laughs> <laughs> no, you still have to solve Poppy. No. And Lorefy. <laughs> okay. And Ban Ban. <laughs> no! But secondly, while well, this theory is really satisfying from a narrative standpoint, it helps to simplify a lot of the confusing elements that have built up over the years. There are a few pieces of evidence that they didn't mention that might poke a few holes in their theory. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Dumb. What's this sound? Please talk about it. It's a flat line. And when does a flat line <coughs> happen? Well, a flat line is Good typically point. shorthand to show that someone has died, usually in a hospital. Exactly. And during FNAF 4, we see things like IV bags, pills, and flowers yeah. surrounding the bed. No All random things Easter that eggs. see in a hospital. Crying Child was in the hospital for his injuries, and then we hear a flat line right after Afton says that he's going to put his son back together. Afton leaves, represented by psychic friend Fred Bear fading away, which then leaves Crying Child alone in the in dark. Like a, he's in like a purgatory. He's the darkness. He's dead. He's He's yeah. alone. Everything about this cutscene seems to be suggesting that he died in this hospital. Yeah. Could you That's my main problem make the argument that William pulled his son off of life support in the hospital and brought him back to an underground bunker where he's going to do experiments on him until he's able to bring him back to life? And that's why we hear a flat line here? Sure, you could make that argument, but it feels really overcome. Yeah, I, I, I think at this point, we need to talk about Occam's Razor. The simplest explanation is most often the correct one. And... and I wouldn't say there is a simple explanation in this. We're talking about FNAF, right? But I think if you're trying to say that this character is also this character who possesses this character and also this character, like, we're, we're making a lot of logical jumps and a lot of jumps with not too much support behind it and also a lot of different holes that then get created by making those leaps. And so I, I'm not too sure what the rationale behind this is, if you know what I mean. I, I, I understand we're trying to make, I guess, the story more concise, right? We're trying to tie together characters so that there's less clutter and so that everything can be tied together more. But I actually do think that if you have more characters here, then you can follow their roots and you can make a cohesive story from it. It's hard, but I think it's possible. And I don't think we need to make one character equal another. And I think going back to the survival logbook, I think 
it was made very distinctly clear in that logbook, which was released around the same time as FNAF 6, that they are two separate characters. And I think that's that's key to understanding this. I also, th I, I, I'm trying to think back to when Scott had the movie script for Cassidy. I'm trying to think if he said anything about like, I don't know, I, I, I maybe that's a, that's a dead end right there. But also in the movie, if we're talking about the movie, um, you know, the five missing children aren't related to anybody else in, in the movie. There's no, like Garrett was Michael's brother, but Garrett wasn't part of the missing children's incident. He, he did go missing, right? He went missing by the hands of William Afton, just like all of the other children, but he wasn't part of the missing children's incident. And yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about a lot of this, but let's continue, see what else there is. And even still, if he did do all of that, there's a room full of people that saw Afton's son get bit. That make it pretty darn hard for Afton to convince anyone that his son went missing as part of some random killer's murdering yeah. spree. There's also that whole speaking Good in point. thing point. I know you had thoughts on. Yes, thank you. I brought up earlier the huge number of parallels between the two spirits inside the Stitch Wraith in the books and the two spirits that are potentially not inside a of huge Golden Freddy in but the game. Sure. Now, yeah. say what you will about book-based evidence, but the epilogues at the end of these things tend to be very important for storytelling. I mean, we saw that explicitly yeah. with the reveal of the mimic. So to focus on this character of the Stitch Wraith, comprised of two spirits across oh, 11 that, books, that. yeah, that feels pretty darn important. And in the Stingers, each spirit inside the Stitch Wraith speaks in the first person. So it would then make sense for one spirit inside of Golden Freddy to say, it's me, singular. It's me, the crying child, your yeah. brother. Yeah, well, that's, that's, what, that's exactly my point. In the Stingers, point. the Stitch Wraith is made up of- No, 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 wait, 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 wait. I, I think, sorry to keep pausing, by the way, I, I, I do want to uh, present a discussion, uh, or begin a discussion at least. Um, I think people sometimes miss, miss the point of the Stitch Wraith. I think a lot of people initially thought it was Ennard, and then a lot of people initially, or a lot of people now still think that it, it's just one huge Golden Freddy parallel, right? But I think it's something a lot bigger than that, right? We We have one entity, it's very symbolic, we have one entity with like the good guy of the story and the bad guy of the story. I'm not saying Andrew is a bad guy, but like um, he is vengeful, okay? That's that's what I mean, more, more vengeful than Jake. So you kind of have like two opposing sides in one body and that's 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 a really cool narrative. I think the, the whole point of the Stitch Wraith was to kind of put an end to the, the first big part of the story if you realize like the Stitch Wraith ends with William Afton drowning in a lake, that's the end of William Afton. We never see him again after that event. And um, and also uh, the Stitch Wraith sets up everything because, you know, happiest days. Uh, it gives all of the children happiest days. It is literally the perfect ending. And the, the whole reason the Stitch Wraith exists is to get that nice ending um, in, in a narrative. And I, I really like it, but I don't think the point of the Stitch Wraith was to say, you know, we have Golden Freddy with two souls. I, I, I think even the new kid could be could be uh, better to compare this to, right? Because you do actually have two souls, technically. You have Kelsey and Devon in Golden Freddy, I, I guess you could say that. Um, or you can, of course, Rosie Porkchop from Together Forever. That is very, very strong parallelism to Golden Freddy. So I, I, I'm not, sh I'm not sure what people are trying to get at with this whole um, Stitch Wraith is equal to Golden Freddy because I don't think that that's necessarily the intention of Scott Cawthon, but. Yeah, I don't know. Andrew, the angry one, is established to not be able to see because his part forms the body. Jake, the nice one, can see because his spirit is trapped in the head part. As such, That's he reports true. what's that happening in the world book. back Fair. to Andrew <laughs> in the body. And what do we see happening in the logbook? Well, it's a similar sort of dynamic. Yeah. One spirit asks, okay, what do you forget see? What I said. And the other one responds, I can't see. It's a direct 
parallel, even down to the happiest day minigame. There's a point in the series when Jake is given the chance to move on and pass into the afterlife, but he chooses to linger back in order to help Andrew. Eventually, one of them moves on while the other is kept to Earth, held back by Afton. Sound familiar? It should. It once again parallels a lot of what we're seeing happen with Golden Freddy in the games. On top of that, dual process theory reminded uh, me of this moment in Flash not quite. Mini games, where the crying child is locked in the back room with a Golden no, Freddy not, costume. Not really. They pointed out the tufts of hair coming out of the suit, explaining this to be an employee who bled out. However, in one of our old videos, you made the valuable point that this head is just sitting too low in the torso. When adults wear it, we see their heads fully out, even when they're sitting. This is something that is explicitly shown to us in places like the graphic novels, which tells us then that the person in the suit here, it's gotta be a child. Again, we see this in the books. In Fazbear Frights, we have seen uh, where kids yeah. reach into the Golden Freddy suit and see black curly hair sitting inside. This is a dead kid, a dead kid that we know was put inside of Golden Freddy. Presumably, this should be the fifth missing child. This is why Crying Child's Fredbear plushie tells him, remember what you saw. He has literally seen the deaths of other kids. Huh, you ever thought that maybe that's the answer? What do you mean? Well, is it possible that the story is actually way simpler than we, the FNAF community, have made it out to be? I maybe. mean, look at the scene. Like, really look at the scene. It is pretty darn self-explanatory. A kid is locked in the storage closet and literal tufts of hair are sticking out of the suit. I remember when I first saw this scene. I overthought this thing to death. Assuming <laughs> that it had to be just more like everything than else. just hair sticking out of the suit. Maybe they were wires or tufts of suit hair or something yeah. like that. Because this was 1983 and by all accounts, it was the first location. It was Fred Bear's family diner. The beginning of the timeline. Right. The missing children's incident didn't happen here. It was at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Clearly these brown pixels had to represent something else. But in retrospect, the scene is pretty explicit. There's a kid dead in this suit. Done. Cut and dry. Remember what you saw? You saw a dead kid. We, as theorists, are so often desperate to search for narrative satisfaction. We bend over backwards to try and justify timelines where Afton is killing kids because of Elizabeth's death, or because he's trying to put his son back together and he wants to run experiments to harvest remnant from other kids. But what if he's just a weird, yeah. sick dude who just I mean, you're right. kids you're one right day? No overcomplicated backstory required. I didn't get to talk about this before leaving the channel, but in Help Wanted 2, if you light the final gravestones in a very specific order, you unlock a huge lore clue in the form of the Bonnie mask. This is the moment that basically confirms that we're playing the game as Bonnie bro. But the order of the gravestones? It feels very intentional. They explicitly give us an order of events. Chica first, then Foxy, Freddy, Bonnie, Golden Freddy fifth, Puppet last. It was really confusing because Charlie dying last didn't make any sort of sense. What about this? A wound first inflicted on me. Yeah, and yet exactly. this gravestone evidence is what the games but are. But we don't know if that's also the order they die, really, but it, it's if that implied. that tuft of hair is to be believed, and really, why wouldn't we believe it? That gravestone timeline could probably be right. Afton was just killing kids because he could. He was a deranged serial killer. Man, retirement really has taken a toll on you. But I also think I see where you're going with this. Crying Child witnesses the dead kids in the suits, and then gets bit by Fredbear on the day of his party. Afton would be devastated by this, promising to put his son back together. He'd be furious at his business partner, Henry, because it was his engineering that did this sure. to his boy. Then, one night, an opportunity presented itself. Charlie was locked outside by some bullies, and so Afton, in a fit of rage, killed Charlie. Unlike all the other killings that were premeditated, this was a crime of passion, and so it broke from all of his usual methods. And that allows this new order of deaths that Steel Wool has given us to make way more sense. Chica was always a the first, first, but not just on of me. the guess, of yeah. all the deaths. That's why Henry made security puppet in the first place. But I don't know. there were a bunch of kids disappearing from the pizzeria. I feel like they're, they're conflicting... What am I trying to say? I, th I feel like they are... Um, they're saying things and then they are taking them back in a way. In the sense that they're saying that... They're saying may maybe the story is really, really simple. Maybe we don't overcomplicate it because, you know, theorists like to overcomplicate things a lot of the time. Maybe we should just shouldn't overcomplicate things. But then you're saying all of this, right? You you are very clearly overcomplicating all of this, um, just for the just for the point of narrative. And um, that's that's the issue with FNAF, right? You you really want to put a narrative into it, and that's probably where a lot of people actually do go wrong. Um, but I I think that um, yeah I, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure what else to say on top of that, but let's just 
Let's finish the video and then I'll say my thoughts, I think. Henry wanted to protect his daughter. Which brings us back to the beginning. Where did we land with the whole dual process theory? Did, did they solve FNAF? Is Cassidy the crying child? I think the answer is yes, but also no. There are oh, two come sides on. This <laughs> right. Is crying child the fifth missing kid that we've called Cassidy for all these years? I'm just... Not I'm sure. not convinced it would on that. Simplify no. a lot, especially the FNAF 3 minigames where there's only five kids. But then we see a kid already dead inside the Golden Freddy suit before Crying Child even it dies. It simplifies and things the and overcomplicates them at the same time. It's fine. Flatline at the end of FNAF 4, which would make it hard for him to be considered missing, let alone yeah. considered one of the missing children specifically. It's true. As much as I like it from a narrative standpoint, there's just as much evidence against it as it is supporting it. Typical FNAF, you know. Well, not completely, because there's the second side of this question. Sure, Crying Child might not be the fifth missing child, but based on what dual process theory presented, I think they might be right that Crying Child's name is Cassidy. William Afton, a deranged serial killer hiding in plain sight, until one day his son Michael decided to play a prank. A prank that would kill his youngest son, Cassidy Afton. It has a nice ring to it, I've got to admit. Maybe oh, for goodness sake. Maybe see it. It's <laughs> frustrating Catch-22, you know? We either get to have the Crying Child's name, and in the process, we lose the established fifth missing yeah. kid name, or Cassidy is the fifth missing kid, and Crying Child remains as nameless as he ever was. I mean, the answer's got to be in here somewhere, surely. The, the second option the is, is way better, I think. Questions with who are you? What's who cares about his and name? With Cassidy not being the fifth missing kid, that leaves the my name gravestone clue wide open. Honestly, my money's on the Foxy Grid. We never <laughs> did solve it. And oh no! Text at the start. Maybe we should take another look. <laughs> oh no 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 no! There's no we here, my friend. I did my time. With that <laughs> this is all on you, man. Oh, oh come well on. Well then, I guess I better get started. It's not like I had a billion other FNAF things to worry about. Regardless, I suppose Confessing. I should thank you for helping me out with this episode, Matt. I know Lorefy has kept you pretty busy. Oh yeah, Lorefy. Nearly forgot that I was on here to promote that. Just got so caught up in the FNAF discussion. Okay, anyway. you know, you know fine well, Matt Pat, that you weren't just here to promote Lorefy. You were here to talk about FNAF because you like talking about FNAF. Speaking of talking about FNAF, um, I've been recording for way much longer than I intended to, but I've had a lot of different discussion points, you know. Um, I think, just to round all this up, I think, good video, first of all. Um, do I agree with everything in this video? Absolutely not. Do I agree with most of the things in this video? Uh, I, I think there are some good points here and there. I, I just think on a whole, like, I, I think there's a lot of confusion right now. And I, I think, I think that there has to, okay. This is, this is something um, I remember hearing about on like some YouTube video sometime. And it, and it actually really stuck with me. And it, it, it's about like science in general, but I'm going to apply it to, to the FNAF law here. And it's the fact that there comes a point where you just have to trust everything that's kind of come before you in a way, right? So think think of it this way, right? Um, people think that the moon landing is fake. The moon landing, the first moon landing was 1969, I believe. Uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin. Um, people believe the moon landing is fake. Why do you believe it's fake? What What is your rationale behind that? What is the purpose of NASA doing that? you kind of have to take it for granted moving on with scientific development. I, I don't know if that was a very good example. I think maybe like the atom or something. I think the atom was first discovered in, oh my God, I, I don't know. I don't know, like early 1900s, <laughs> something like that. Um, or like Einstein's theory of special relativity, 1900s. Like, oh no, that's a really bad example as well. I'm blabbering. The atom was discovered very early on, the atom was discovered before a lot of us were born, right? We have to kind of take for granted that atoms exist in order to progress with science. And in the same sort of manner, we we have to kind of, come, we, we come to a point where everybody has believed that Cassidy or the fifth victim of the missing children's incident and the crying child are two completely separate characters. That has been a thing that people have believed since FNAF 4, right? If that was completely inaccurate, or if Scott wanted to change that, he could have done that, uh, or he could have shown that he could have clarified in many different ways 
in the next coming games and books, but he hasn't. I, I feel like he really hasn't. And, and, and the logbook, you could say, could go either way. I, I, that's fine. Okay, you can you can say it goes either way because I I do really like that that point about the word search actually being changed letters in the book. I don't think that was the intention though. I I don't know. I think it's whatever you decide it is at at the end of the day. Like I I'm not going to judge you um badly if 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 you believe that the crying child is Cassidy, that's that's fine. That's your theory. I just want to hear the evidence for that and, and the purpose for why you believe that other than conciseness of of the narrative. But I think that was a very good video. If you want me to watch dual process theories entire video, then I can do that. But that's going to be probably at least three hours long based on how long this video is compared to uh, the game theories. But um, thank you to Matt and to Tom for presenting this game theory. Thank you guys so much for watching and thank you for including me in the video. I, I didn't even expect that at all. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in another video. Goodbye.